You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Michael Snyder, pop culture pundit, columnist, constantly offering advice, opinions, counsel on things that are related to television, movies, music. I am going to say this before the audience even hears your first utterance. I've known you many, many years and never have you made a recommendation that hasn't been accurate, which I can't really say about anyone because usually tastes differ or whatever. You are extraordinary. Michael Snyder, welcome to The Edge. Glad to be back and uh, certainly teetering on the edge like everyone else in the world today. But... It's a crazy world, Michael. Make it better and we have no time. So just get us into the best movies of 2017 and what you're expecting if there's time for the holiday season to be particularly good. Well, I'll tell you what. We all have... You have a top 10 or something like I, every I have, other I have uh, a sweet critic. 16, a superlative 16, but I must tell you that it's very, very subjective. The, uh, you know, th- it's an opinion, but uh, let's roll through them. Can we roll through them quickly and do it in alphabetical order? I don't want to, like, kind of play favorites. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so you're not going to go down in some kind of numerical thing. You want to go alphabetical order. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Okay, let's start with a movie I don't think a lot of people saw called Baby Driver, which is from Edgar Wright. Who saw was, it! Who was, oh, there you go. He's the filmmaker who did the funny genre parodies, uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, The World's End. He's done some terrific stuff, and he started out in music videos in a big way, and he brings that expertise to Baby Driver, which is basically about an intrepid young wheel man, played by uh, Ansel Elgort, who works for a gang of thieves uh, that features a couple tough guys played by, are you ready, John Hamm and Jamie Foxx, no slouches. And they hero, ugly up John Hamm. A little bit. They, uh, our hero wants out so he can be with his dream girl, played by the lovely British actress Lily, Lily James. You may know her from Downton Abbey. I think she was Rose in Downton Abbey. Uh-huh. Uh, in any event... He's uh, a driver. He drives. He's a getaway driver. They keep pulling him back in. He doesn't want to do it. But what's the weird thing? They do the. It feels like a long music video. Baby Driver. They play a lot of mu- a lot of music. Yeah, you got your car chases. You got your crime. Your romance and this rock and soundtrack. And again, Edgar Wright is so expert at doing music videos and the beautiful quick cutting. There is a sequence at the beginning of the film to Harlem Shuffle that has got to be one of my favorite two or three or four minutes in movies for the past few years. I say, hey, what's not to like about Baby Driver? And I might add, one of the great parking jobs, there is a parking job sequence which takes like 15 seconds that is just brilliant. And let's point out... At the beginning of the movie. Hey, me too, everybody. No, not really. But uh, Kevin Spacey's in this film, does great work, and I would hate to think that his entire filmography would be completely smeared by what's been going on in the real world with Kevin Spacey. But he's in this and does uh, his typical great job. All right, moving on. What else do you have? Colossal, I don't think is going to be to everyone's taste, but I thought it was fantastic. Anne Hathaway stars. It's a thoroughly original mix of sci-fi, fantasy, and psychological comedy, believe it or not. What's um, the sci-fi part? I, want, I like well, sci-fi. Th- this, is, um, this is all about a, this feckless... Different planet? This feckless... No, it's our planet. This feckless woman somehow inadvertently is controlling the physical acts of a giant monster in a South Korean city from thousands of miles away here in America, leading her mundane life, having problems with boys or men, if you will, and uh, she doesn't realize that she's wreaking havoc every time she thrusts her arms around. Um, the skyscrapers are, are falling and people are being stepped on as she stomps through her life. So this is Anne Hathaway who yeah, is, has Anne, that control. The Anne Hathaway. Uh, Jason Sudeikis and Dan Stevens play the uh, two less than ideal men in her life. So now, it is I, kind of funny. It's a crazy concept and for me it, it worked. Okay, moving um, on. Darkest Hour. Okay. Um, now that's the Winston Churchill thing? Gary Oldman disappears under the most real realistic prosthetic makeup I've ever seen. It doesn't look like makeup, and he's playing an historical figure, Winston Churchill, and he's delivering like a career peak performance here. Um, Woody Harrelson played LBJ in a movie called Lee and Lyndon Johnson, the president after Kennedy, in LBJ this past year, and the prosthetic makeup looked like a Halloween mask. This does not. So you're not taken out of the performance, and what this does is give us uh, a very personal view of Prime Minister Winston Churchill just turned Prime Minister uh, in the early years of World War II. And uh, it's, uh, his wife Clementine is in this, played by Kristen Scott Thomas, and the newly uh, anointed PM has to meet with King George, the stuttering king from uh, the king's speech, uh, speech and uh, the, he's the father of Elizabeth and Margaret. Uh, he's played by Ben Mendelsohn here, and they have a little kind of friction This is a wonderful film that also looks at some of the events of World War II as they were unfolding, which brings us to my next favorite film of the year uh, on my list, which 
is Dunkirk. Um, and it covers a lot of the same time and period of Darkest Hour, but director Christopher Nolan has put together this unbelievably sprawling, immersive recreation of the, the situation that faced the Allied forces on the beaches of Dunkirk early in World War II. And that situation was what? They got trapped? Yeah, and they were, it necessitated a retreat to save the army to fight again another day. And um, so... This is a top grade ensemble cast. You got Kenneth Browner, uh, Killian Murphy, uh, Mark Rylance, Tom Hart. Tom Hardy acting with his eyes for much of, the, of his uh, time on screen. Um, it's like I said, immersive. You feel like you're in the middle of everything. And Tom Hardy was the bad guy in the Batman film. He right? was Bane in the third of the Batman films. So he acts with his eyes a lot. He can do or a it. muffled dialogue. He can do a great man. I am going to destroy you. Nice. I'm scared. Uh, he does a great job. Um, no matter what he does, he he played a Jewish mob leader in the, uh, the third series of Peaky Blinders. For God's oh, is that sake. right? Oh yeah, he uh, was set in the twenties in the UK. Um, he's a fantastic actor. Anyway, Dunkirk, Get Out is my next choice for one of the best oh, films of the year. I haven't seen that yet. Really need to see. It's it. sort of this unbelievably startling and and kind of accomplished uh, debut as a screenwriter and director by Jordan Peele of Key and Peele, the sketch comedy duo, and also these guys were on Mad TV. They're um, brilliant. And Absolutely. Brilliant. Really wonderful. And this is a very scary and kind of, uh, I, what's the phrase, wickedly droll film um, about racism, essentially. Uh, Daniel K Kaluuya has this uh, star making turn as a young black man whose white girlfriend, played by Allison Williams, daughter of Brian Williams, uh, the, the girl who was in Girls uh, opposite Lena Dunham, she brings her boyfriend home to see her. Um, parents, they're well-to-do parents, and all of a sudden the bottom drops out. Bradley Whitford and Catherine Keener are mom and dad, and man, this tur this ha turns on a dime, and suddenly you're thrust into this sort of nightmare that he must be experiencing. Wow! Now who's bad? The the white people are bad, or the black people are bad? Yeah, I don't. Spoilers. Okay, all right. <laughs> Gotta um, be the white people are bad. The white you couldn't people, make the movie if it was the black people. It's about are bad. racism. Okay. okay. All right. All it's right. About racism. So I want to see it. Figure it out. Right. Uh, okay. Here's one that's kind of an outlier in a in a big way. It's sort of one of those unappreciated gems, and I'm going to rattle a few more off quickly. But Good Time. It stars of all Loved people. It. Twilight heartthrob. Robert Pattinson, and he plays this kind of older of two hapless New York City brothers who are kind of punk criminals, and they try a bank robbery. And the younger brother has, is mentally challenged, and the older brother is his protector. So there's a real um, George and Lenny of Mice and Men thing going on. But at That's the same, right. That's exactly right. But at the same time, uh, the older brother, Constantine, uh, who feels responsible for him, is kind of a loose cannon in his own way. And when the younger brother is called caught and uh, in jail and going to be transferred, the older brother feels compelled to try and spring him. So it turns into this kind of mix of Martin Scorsese's uh, Mean Streets, a little of Mice and Men, and After Hours, because there's an odyssey through New York, uh, New York in the evening where Constantine is trying desperately to somehow save his brother. Um, now I see why you're a writer, because that is a perfect summary of that movie. Well, uh, it's done by the Safdie brothers, who do a lot of uh, cool, low-budget, kind of uh, gritty, dark... And, and Ben Safdie, one of the two brothers who, uh, in the writing directing team, plays the younger brother and is also really, really terrific. Um, That's I, called, again, at the, and we should re remind everybody at the end of these descriptions, what the movie good is. Good time. Good time. And it, it, to me, it was a, a real wonderful surprise. Uh, I, Tanya, um, I went in a little bit with a chip on my shoulder. Margot Robbie, I think, is too beautiful to play the, the working class Olympic bad girl of skating Tanya Harding. She's just too beautiful. They, they try to uh, ugly her up a little bit. It's kind of like, uh, you remember what Charlize Theron was in Monster playing Aileen Warnos? You know, they did make her. They did ugly her yeah, up. Yeah, they couldn't. You can't do it with Margot Kidd. Kidder. Yeah, he put braces Margot on Robbie, yeah. Uh, Margot Robbie. Yeah, well, Margot Kidder is another story. Um, Margot, they put uh, braces on her when she's playing 15 or 16. Hey, she's a grown woman, people. But but it's the maybe the best performance she's given in her career so far. And, uh, and where it, do people know Margot Robbie from? She's uh, Harley Quinn in the Suicide Squad film. She's the wife of uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character in The Wolf of Wall Street. She was her, she made her big splash for me in America on ABC's Pan Am period piece TV series about uh, airline hostesses, and she plays this wholesome Midwestern girl. She's an Aussie, in fact. She's wonderful in this, but I have to say, this is both tragicomic. I mean, you feel bad for the, the, you know all of these people in the Tanya Harding story, but it's also um, kind of sharp 
and and clever and on top of everything else as we see tanya try to bring down her skating rival uh nancy kerrigan uh mostly through the ministrations of her bad boy husband, Jeff Galuli, you also meet the mother of Tanya Harding. And Jeff Galuli is played by Sebastian Stan from the Captain America films. He's the winter soldier in uh, Marvel's Avengers movies and such. And this is a fine performance on his part. But Allison Janney, as Tanya's mother, is completely Oscar nomination worthy, might win it all. And she, this, this woman, wow. the mother of Tanya Harding, is maybe the most vile creature I've seen on screen since Hannibal Lecter. I wow. mean, this is not an nice person so you're saying you in a way you see where the the tanya harding uh, no holes barred the playing dirty right competition the, the negativity and her desire to sort of uh, basically impress her mother or win her mother's love but this is a toxic situation on all fronts and uh, they they do a beautiful job of it i i i don't want uh, you know, Margot Robbie to be less beautiful than she is, but that's the only flaw I thought in this film that stood out. So, anyway, moving on. Another, that was I, I, Tanya. I, Tanya. Another woman-centered movie, Lady Bird. Um, this is not just a coming-of-age movie. Um, this is uh, also, I, I have to call it, you know, uh, it's a painfully honest look at mother-daughter relations. Uh, it's a wonderful period piece set in the early 2000s in Sacramento, California, of all places, about um, a teenage girl who is at odds with her mom. And has Why was it set in, t- in Sacramento? Because it's kind of autobiographical. It's by Greta Gerwig, the queen of the indies, who basically plays a Greta Gerwig character in every movie she does. And uh, she has kind of taken the mantle of indie movie queen from Parker Posey, I would think. She's been in things like like Frances Ha, and uh, which she actually had a, a part, I think, in writing, uh, and Mistress America, and she's a pretty wonderful actress, but I don't think she could have played herself in this thing, so instead she gets the great young Irish actress, Saoirse Ronan. Uh, Saoirse Ronan is in a kind of another stratosphere, and she's going to be in the awards. Saoirse Ronan is the deal. You also get kind of a look at high school social order, you know, like cliques and such. You get all of these things jumbled into this wonderful dramedy about a relationship between a mother and a daughter. It and is funny, and then there's a there's moments of heartbreak, sort of. It's really good, and it I'm is. not a, it's not a chick movie or anything, even though it's no. a female coming-of-age story. I, it was one of my favorite movies of the year. And uh, let's also give Lori Metcalf some props. Talk about playing a mother. Alice and Janney's big competition in my book for Best Supporting Actress, Lori Metcalf as the mother of the Greta Gerwig character in Lady Bird. Great stuff all the way around. Now this one um, may surprise people and maybe I just had it so fresh in my mind when I was pulling my list together, but I thought Molly's Game was pretty good. I mean, Lady wow. Bird is something else, but Molly's Game was pretty good. It's written and directed by Aaron Sorkin of TV's West Wing and The American President and, and various other projects. And it's the true story of Molly Bloom. No, not the character from Ulysses, uh, the classic novel, uh, but instead another Olympic hopeful who had her career derailed, but she didn't get it as far as uh, Tanya Harding she got. She was a skier. She was a competitive skier, but she has an injury. And uh, because of unexpected career twists, she ends up overseeing a series of private poker games with pro card sharks, celebrities, mobsters. And this is these are big bucks events. And eventually the news starts uh, tightening on her as uh, someone gets sour on the situation and, you know, yeah, she the, goes from L.A. to New York. Things go cock hoop as people say. I guess I'll interject here. This episode features a conversation with the real Molly Bloom. Michael didn't know that as no. he says this. We talked to her after her book was released, Molly's Game, which I read. I know a lot of the people in the high-stakes poker community and did at the time anyway, so like Toby Maguire and this sort of thing. Uh, Toby Maguire is not mentioned in the movie. He is, I think, mentioned in the book. But anyway, if you want to hear Molly's story from the horse's mouth, stay tuned because we will have the conversation with Molly Bloom in this episode. So go ahead. Wonderful. Well, in any event, uh, Let again... me ask you about the Aaron Sorkin thing. There are not a lot of long Aaron Sorkin speeches and, and you know, that's what I really... But I, I'm want to see it because it's poker and right, right, right. we talked to Molly Bloom as I say but man that Aaron Sorkin he can lay those goddamn speeches there's on. There's very little walking and talking but there is some crisp dialogue and man talk about terrific Jessica uh, Chastain is totally compelling and wonderful as Molly and beautifully shaded performance on, on every level and Idris Elba plays her lawyer and Kevin Costner plays her dad and Kevin Costner uh, in one scene will tear you up. 
I mean, it really, you wonder, is Kevin Costner a good actor? All you have to do is look at this scene, you know, what quality he's brought to the project. Wow. Yeah, I'd say Molly's Game is worth looking out for. It's in your Sweet 16. It is in my Sweet 16. Mudbound uh, is a well-wrought, superbly acted, and very painful history lesson from the director and co-screenwriter Dee Reese, a woman uh, in this new wave of female directors who's making quite an impact. Um, There was this pervasive, crippling economic problem, uh, class division, racial uh, racial strife in America, well, in the rural South, and continues to be an issue, believe it or not. But during the 1940s, as World War II was getting going, there were problems that were ripping people apart. And in the subsequent peacetime, racism was still a problem, even for a brave black soldier coming home from the war. And this is about a white soldier and a black soldier coming back to work on a farm in rural Mississippi and how their lives impact and how they uh, have to deal with very, very different problems. Wow, that sounds great. And that it's called Mudbound. It is. Uh, and the cast includes the British actress Carrie Mulligan, one of my favorites, playing uh, Southern. Uh, Gary. I'm so glad, by the way, that these British and Australian people are coming over, the immigrants, to do the jobs <laughs> that no Americans want to do. No, no one isn't. wants to be a star in a movie. No, no, not at all. Uh, Garrett Hedlund, Jason Clark, uh, Jason Mitchell, and Mary J. Blige, the singer, gives a tremendous performance as a beleaguered uh, black woman in this rural southern situation. Wow. So it's mudbound. Okay, moving on. Phantom Thread. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis says this is his last performance, so he says, and uh, he is astonishing as Reynolds Woodcock, who is this tightly wound, kind of elegant and acclaimed fashion designer in early 1950s Britain, in London, which was still a fashion center back then, even before Swing in London really blew the doors off. Um, And Woodcock has this really strange symbiotic relationship with his sister, who is played by the superb Leslie Manville, and that relationship is jeopardized when he meets his muse, uh, who's working as a waitress in a seaside resort where he goes to unwind. And the waitress is played by the uh, Luxembourg actress Vicky Crepes, and uh, it's fantastic. She loves this guy, and he's really impossible to love. And she plays quiet havoc with the relationship between him and his sister and him and his career. Um, and this is a reunion between Daniel Day-Lewis and his director in There Will Be Blood, the great Paul Thomas Anderson, and Anderson wrote and directed this thing, and he's one of my favorite directors, and he does not disappoint in Phantom Thread, which has this quiet undercurrent of of uh, pain and tragedy, and again, it's gorgeous to look at. And, and, and he wrote the script as well, didn't he? Paul yeah, Thomas Anderson. Uh, absolutely. He's just a really talented guy. Let's lighten things up. Okay. Uh, that was Phantom Thread. The Big Sick, I mean, you can call it a docu-rom-com or, or just something really, <laughs> really charming. In any event, the movie is a treat. The drama Advertises how the Pakistani-born comedian and actor um, Kumal Nanjani from Silicon Valley, very, very funny on that show, and kind of hapless there. But you see, he's like a real person. And he actually met and fell in love with Emily, an American grad student, and she would eventually become his wife, but they would have to go up against some kind of bizarre illness that strikes her, and no one understands what it is or, or how it happens and what it's doing to her. And you've got cultural differences and this debilitating illness, and yet this is a very sweet, funny comedy. And it co-stars Nanjiani as himself and Zoe Kazan. I've had a crush on her oh, since. She's so adorable. She, she's so adorable. And she plays Emily in this thing. And as her parents, Holly Hunter and Ray Romano are so good and w- lovable in their own way. And obviously, again, there's a cultural difference between the Americans and the Pakistani family of his. And his family, of course, is horrified that he's getting involved with a a white woman, with an American woman. Um, And uh, this thing is written by our star and by his real-life wife, Emily Gordon. So it's, it's, it tells the story from their perspective, and I assume much of it is true. And even if it's kind of fictionalized or, or has been punched up with uh, jokes and humor, it's just a wonderful experience. The Big Sick. The Shape of Water. That, this may be my favorite film of the year. I think it's tied with... Is it super scary? I want to go see it, but I don't do well with horror well, movies. Well, uh, what if the cheesy 50s monster movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, was actually a reciprocal love story where the creature and his female victim actually cared for one another. That's the shape of water. Oh, uh, so maybe the romance trumps the scary? Well, the performances are exquisite. The writing, the art direction, the, the cast. You know, I, you don't even have to 
mention Richard Jenkins, the great Richard Jenkins, who plays a supporting role in here to let you know that this is a fantastic sl- uh, set of actors doing. Well, it's the director too work. is the big thing. Guillermo del Toro, who you wrote it and directed wrote it. it. He co-wrote it and directed it. He's the guy behind Pan's Labyrinth, Pacific Rim, the Pan's, Hellboy movies. Pan's Labyrinth was disturbing. I wanted it to be a sweet movie where she goes into it, and, Pan, and it, it, it left be, me and it left no. me by the side of the road. That's his masterpiece. But this is right up there, and as far but as is I'm this going to leave me by the side of the road again? I. I hope so. <laughs> this is exciting and heartbreaking and visually stunning, and it's basically a fable set during the Cold War in the 1960s, and Sally Hawkins, the British actress who you may remember from Blue Jasmine, Happy Go Lucky, she plays this motor mouth mall in one of my favorite British crime uh, movies, which is a movie called Layer Cake, and it was Daniel Craig's, I don't know, audition tape for James Bond. He plays a middle management drug dealer, but Sally Hawkins has a small role where I was like, who is that? I think you recommended this layer. Layer cake's like a mobster movie. Yeah, it's, got, it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, Michael that. Gambon, Daniel Craig, uh, yeah. Colm Meany. It's really one of my okay, all-time but, faves. But that's, In any uh, event, back that's to another, this year. Yeah. Yeah. So Sally Hawkins plays this mute cleaning woman in a secret U.S. lab facility in the 60s, and she stumbles upon and connects with their great prize. They're, they've captured this creature with these remarkable powers, this amphibious thing played by Doug Jones, who's doing good work on Star Trek Discovery now as the second in command on that show. Now they can't get him out of alien makeup. No, he's, he's yeah, he, he was actually the fearsome creature in Pan's Labyrinth. He's the amphibious creature in Hellboy. He, Doug Jones is wonderful in this film. And their enemy, Michael Shannon, plays a, a kind of a sinister government agent who wants to control this creature and his awesome powers. Uh, this is a thrilling film. Uh, Octavia Spencer plays the best friend of our Sally Hawkins character and The Shape of Water, highly recommended Recommended. And my neck and neck here, if you had to like put me on the spot and say, what did you like the best this year? Shape of Water or Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. This is a mix of really deep and unique characters and kind of dark humor and a shockingly violent moments. It's from Irish writer-director Martin McDonough, who did In Bruges, which is another film I'm totally enamored of. And this is basically an investigation into small-town tragedy and mores and political issues, and it showcases Frances McDormand, who is at her best. This is maybe one of her best performances since Fargo, and it's very much like a movie by her husband, Joel Cohn, and his brother, the Cohn brothers. Yeah, you're right. Actually, I never thought of that until you just said it in this moment, but it does have sort of that feel. And as her adversaries, a kind of a frenemy in Woody Harrelson as the police captain, and as his functionary, who is a total loose cannon, Sam Rockwell, and these people are at their best. You know, all is forgiven, Woody, after LBJ, you're so good in three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, and Sam Rockwell doesn't give bad performances, and he's in his clover here as this kind of lunatic officer on the local police force. Essentially, and there's some sweet twists in this it, sort it, of... Uh, totally. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice yarn. Mildred, played by McDormand, is disgusted with how the police have handled the death of her daughter. They haven't solved the crime. They don't know who's responsible. So in order to kind of taunt them and cause them to have to reflect and readdress this case, she basically rents three billboards outside the town they all live in, castigating the police force. And this, of course, puts the town into an uproar. Trouble ensues. This is sort of... I don't know. It's it's a zesty movie. What can I tell you? It's, and you'll your jaw will drop at times. Wrapping things up with my last two, Wind River. There's a long history of urban film noir and crime dramas, you know, set in dimly lit corners of the big city. I love that stuff. Well, this is wilderness noir. Um, a game tracker played by Jeremy Rennett has to tread very, very lightly when he's teamed with a novice FBI agent played by one of his co-stars from The Avengers, Elizabeth Olsen, and uh, they have to solve the murder of a young woman on a snow-swept Native American reservation. And this is also the home to the tracker's ex-wife. Uh, this is written and directed by Taylor Sheridan, who did the script for Sicario. I really thought Wind River was a wonderful crime drama and also, uh, you know, shows a lot of the, the plight faced by Native Americans in the sort of poor and kind of marginalized reservation. Life. Very well put, and I love that movie as well. In fact, I didn't think it got enough acclaim. It's been released now for several 
several months. Yeah, right? Jeremy Renner. He's not one of my favorites, but he's great in this film. This is a terrific movie. Uh, okay. Wind River. Wind River, yes. Okay, let's wrap it up. Wonder Woman is a World War I period piece and part of the DC Comics cinematic universe and is the best thing that they've done since they decided to do an interrelated set of movies, much like Marvel Comics have done with the Avengers, Iron Man, Hulk, etc. Uh, but this is better than the Batman and Superman stuff they've done recently. Uh, and it's the introduction of the amazing Amazon warrior Wonder Woman who shows up in Batman vs. Superman in the current Justice League film. But this is her movie, and it stars the fabulous Israeli actress Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. And she kind of embodies this strong, charismatic, and compassionate superheroine. Chris Pine, who uh, we know from the Star Trek movies and other films, plays her undaunted leading man, American soldier Steve Trevor. Again, it's World War I. And um, she lives with her Amazon sisters on the island of Themyscira until man's world basically upsets their paradise, like living by kind of bringing the war to the shores of the Paradise Island. And Wonder Woman decides she's going to go out and help stop this war. And um, Patty... Uh, the actress Patty Jenkins, who directed Monster, I might add, and Charlize oh. Theron in Monster, and won an Oscar for it, she has just the right touch for Wonder Woman. And uh, I have to say, um, you get social commentary, you get humorous moments, you get loads of heart, all amid the battles. And it's all about bringing the message of peace, this woman bringing the message of peace to mankind. And But peace through war, right? That's the right way. Yeah, baby. Take them down. Um, uh, Michael, I love that list. So from 16 to the end, in alphabetical order. Yeah, rattle them off. I'll rattle them off. We started with Baby Driver, then Colossal, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Good Time, I, Tanya, Lady Bird, Molly's Game, Mudbound, Phantom Thread, The Big Sick, The Shape of Water, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Wind River, and Wonder Woman. And there have been other great films, foreign movies and cartoons, uh, animated things like Coco, which I love, but I wanted to just do live action English language films as my central focus. If you do get a chance, there are some foreign language movies, and marinatimes.com is going to include a lot of other lists of the best films of the year for me, in addition to those, including uh, documentaries I thought were wonderful, uh, my top 10 underappreciated gems of the year, and uh, of course, sci fi and fantasy blockbusters beyond Wonder Woman and Colossal and The Shape of Water that I also thought were worthwhile. So, yeah, you're very good with a lot of different genres the comic book genres, the superhero genres, that Marvel world, the documentaries the foreign language you're just god you're so good at so, all of this stuff i don't know when you have time to see it all well you know if you get a chance you should definitely go to marinatimes.com on january 1st and check out these other lists marinatimes.com to see michael snyder's complete list of all of these different films we just gave you a little taste of his sweet 16 michael snyder critic pundit always great always moving us through i want to thank you you're very welcome pal we leave you with the edge magic michael snyder everybody